Inside Quest. We are the lunar module for your mind, and our goal is to bring on the world's most delicious thinkers and help your intellect achieve escape velocity. And if you are looking to send your brain into the outermost reaches of what is possible, seriously, there's no better guest than the man joining us today. He's an entrepreneur and philanthropist who has the guts to stare nakedly at the largest problems that we face as a society and say, that's my problem to solve. He's a member of the Board of Trustees of the X Prize, and I have had the very, very good fortune of watching this man firsthand dedicate his considerable talents, energy, and expertise to moving the world forward when there were no crowds, no cameras, no money to be made, nothing. It was literally just him and his internal compass. He is a ball of enthusiasm and a joy to be around. In fact, this man is the emotional equivalent of nuclear fission. Energy pours off of him. It is literally crazy. He's insanely optimistic, super enthusiastic, and his unbridled optimism is supremely contagious. But he's not an empty dreamer spouting funny anecdotes. You guys know that would drive me nuts. He has got a do mentality, and he is a self-made billionaire who immigrated to the US with five bones in his pocket and managed to somehow get the brightest minds on the planet to follow him into the impossible. And against all the odds, time and time again, he's made things happen. And he's the founder of some seriously audacious and seriously successful companies, including World Innovation Institute, iNome, TalentWise, Intellius, Infospace, and Moon Express, a company blazing a trail to the moon to unlock its resources for the benefit of life here on Earth. He was named Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year, Silicon India's most admired serial entrepreneur, and he received the Albert Einstein Technology Medal for his pioneering achievements in technology. And on top of all that, he believes that the successful among us have a moral imperative to give back. At a time when this guy could retire to a beautiful island somewhere warm, instead he has thrown himself passionately into the task of helping others. He doesn't just throw money at problems though, that's something about him that I really like. Instead, he really makes the demand that his philanthropy look as much like his entrepreneurship as possible, meaning that it's self-sustaining and even self-perpetuating. So please help me in welcoming the man who has seemingly given more TED Talks than anyone else on the planet, a man who knows no limits, the self-made billionaire philanthropist who's hell-bent to make this world and beyond a better place, Naveen Jain. Thank you. So you and I have had, or at least from my perspective, the good fortune uh, to get to know each other long before coming on camera here. We're both involved with the X Prize. Um, you're sort of the the energy that keeps the X Prize going. It's really, really phenomenal. The way that you drive that stuff forward. Talk to me a little bit about what is it that draws you to the X Prize? How do you sustain that level sure. of enthusiasm for what honestly to the outside world must seem crazy? Well, I think you know, X Prize is one of the best ways to look at how do you solve problems. Uh, there is no doubt that there are plenty of problems on Earth. But if you really think about it, every single problem is really a great opportunity for an entrepreneur to create an amazing business at the same time. Because the best way to create a great company is to create a company that can help a billion people or solve a large problem. So if you want to make a billion dollars, all you have to do is solve a $10 billion problem. That's and, it. Right? And think about it. What are these $10 billion problems? Education affordable health care, water, diagnosing the diseases. If you can solve any one of these problems, it's a multi-billion, or maybe some of them are trillion dollar uh, mm. uh, problems, right? So all you have to do is start looking at how to solve them. And the reason I love X Prize is, so when you start a company, you always start with the thing, can you find the best team to come and work with you? And in some sense, in that case, you're looking for a needle in this haystack of all the talent around you. What incentive prizes like X Prize do is they let the needle come to you and you say, here is the problem I want solved. And here is what I would call problem to be solved. Here are the success criteria. And if you can do that, then you actually win this prize. And what you will find is when you're looking to hire someone, you tend to hire someone who is good at that problem, that means you end up hiring experts. And what you find is that more and more, 
every one of the X Prize, it has never been won by experts. It always tend to be the people who know nothing about it or the non-experts who end up winning the prize. Because, you know, think about if you were to start a company and say, I'm going to go start a company in medical space. And most mm -hmm. people say, what do you know about that medical space? And the answer is nothing. And that's what makes me the best person to disrupt that industry. Because when you know nothing about it, you don't know what not to try. And better yet, you become the most dangerous person in that industry because you will try things that they already have assumed are not going to work. Just because something may not have worked 10 years ago, in the world of exponential technology, 10 years is a long time and things have really changed. Mm -hmm. So things that did not work actually may be possible today. Yeah, I want to put a pin in that because sure. what's really <laughs> amazing, assuming that we can get more and more people to believe in it, is the biggest reason people don't try something is they think I know nothing about it, yeah. right? And here at Quest, you've got uh, the number one nutrition company yeah. on the planet, and none of the three of us had ever done a company in nutrition ever, right? Sure. So we looked at the problem sure. and we didn't know what couldn't be done, and exactly. so we came in with blind enthusiasm, yeah. and it's yeah. like, oh, hey, we can do anything, right? Yeah. So. And we often joke that if we had known how hard it was going to be, we, would we wouldn't have, have gotten it. into it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was, it was the naivete of the beginner, the very fact that we had enthusiasm and not enough knowledge to yes. be scared. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> which we should sure. have been. Yeah. But not enough knowledge to be scared that actually let us move forward. So it's a really fascinating concept. How do you, Naveen Jain, help your kids huh? embody that? Like, how, how do you, my real question is, how do you teach that? Because I think so many sure. people never get there. So I actually think that is the easiest part. In some sense, uh, the, it, you would think it's easy when people have hunger and you say, you know, you really want to succeed because you have nothing and you have this hunger to succeed. Mm. But what if your children actually grow up in an affluent family? Yeah. How do you keep that hunger alive? And in some sense, we have been extremely fortunate that we have three children and they all grew up in wonderful home with plenty of resources at their disposal but you know in some sense our oldest who is now 26 he started something called Kairos Society when he was 17 years old that went on to become the world's largest college entrepreneurship thing Whoa. at 21 he started a company called human and guess what not only he started made it successful he sold the company by the time I even figured out what he was going to do <laughs> right <laughs> right uh, we have our daughter who is a senior at Stanford and our youngest is also a freshman at Stanford, right? So these kids have gone on to do amazing things. So why and how? One of the things we did as parents is to redefine what success is. That's and we told them that success is never about how much money you have in the bank. It is always about how many lives have you been able to impact positively. And the more lives you are able to impact positively, the more successful you are. So in some sense, it wasn't about money. And second thing was about saying your self-esteem and your net worth or self-worth is about what you create, not what you own. You can own a lot, wow. but if you don't create anything, you still are worth nothing. Right. That is the second thing we did. And the third thing we actually focused on was the only way you know somebody has been successful is the day they become humble is the day they become successful. If you have an iota of arrogance left in you, then you're still trying to prove something to yourself or someone else. Wow. I almost can't hear you right now because you said something that hit me so hard. Number two. Yeah. Uh, that it's not about what you own, it's about what you create. Yes. That is earth-shaking for me. Um, what made you come to that realization? How do you impart that to your kids? Because you get what you incentivize, sure. right? And it's clear in your household you're incentivizing something other than traditional business success. Yeah. Um, what made you realize that it's about what you create? Well, in some sense, you know, we all get tremendous amount of pleasure when you start something and you create something out of nothing, mm -hmm. right? So as an entrepreneur, you start companies because you believe you can go change the way things are done. You can change the way people live their lives. You can change the trajectory of how humanity is gonna move forward in the future. And once you have that dream 
as an entrepreneur, your job is not just to have a dream, it's to go out and actually do it. And the reason you're able to do that is because you believe you can create something. And why wouldn't you want your children to have that pleasure and deny them that pleasure of creating something rather than simply having it, right? And as you see, that peop the behavior you want is the behavior you incentivize, right? Mm -hmm. If you really believe the entrepreneurship is important to society, you make them the heroes. The heroes you make are the heroes you're going to create. Today in our own society, who are our heroes? The athletes, the actors, the Hollywood. That's not our heroes. We should be making the entrepreneurs, the you know, scientists, they are our heroes because they are the ones who are at the end of the day going to change the society. So Tom, one of the things that also I believe is there is no problem that is big enough that innovation and entrepreneurship can't solve and they have to come together. The great minds who have amazing research, they can't go out and change the world. And the great entrepreneurs who know how to take it to the market, they can't do anything unless they have the research. So bringing them together, the innovation and entrepreneurship is how you move the society forward. You have a really powerful definition of what an entrepreneur is, an entrepreneurial mindset. Would you share that? Sure. So I think the entrepreneur is not a person who actually starts a company. To me, the entrepreneurship is about solving a problem. So there are many of us, in fact, all of us are really good at talking about the problem. You know, this sucks, this sucks, and this sucks. We all know about everything that sucks, all the problems. And then we're really good at also saying, why didn't someone solve this? Why can't someone go out and fix the damn pothole? And, and there are really good people out there also who go out and say, oh, I think I might have a solution how to do that. Mm. And these are the guys, call them visionaries, call them whatever you want. But there's only one type of person who wakes up and says, you know what, what can I do about it? I'm going to go out and fix this. And that group of people who go out and actually do it, are the entrepreneurs. And it doesn't matter whether you're inside quest, solving a problem, you are an entrepreneur. People call them intrapreneurs, whatever you call them. At the end of the day, you are an entrepreneur. You see a problem, you solve a problem, you're an entrepreneur. Mm. Yeah, that, that's super powerful. But you make a distinction I've never heard anybody make before, which I think is really, really important, and I'm going to immediately assume it into my own belief system, so thank you, uh, which is that the innovation is separate from the entrepreneur, and that at the end of the day, if you're not doing something about it, it becomes a dream, right? Like, assume Edison, he makes the light bulb, oh my gosh, it's amazing, what a brilliant innovation. But if he hadn't been able to bring it to market, then it, right. it would have gone nowhere, and if you look in, modern day example of what's happening, look at Elon Musk, yes. right? So Elon Musk is the, is the quintessential innovator entrepreneur, yes. where he has, through his team, I'm sure largely, sure. and himself coming up with true innovations that are pushing the space program forward, pushing the automobile industry <coughs> to advance in ways that they haven't in <coughs> decades and decades and decades. Mm -hmm. And yet, he also knows how to get people excited about it. Yep to put it in uh, literally a vehicle that people will pay for because yeah. it's beautiful, it's sexy, yeah. it's you know better than what came before it from a, just a pure experiential standpoint. Mm -hmm. So it's really incredible when you see somebody marrying those two things. Mm -hmm. Now I want to tie this back to what you were saying earlier because a lot of people they're working in, um, he gives some amazing talks about education, the fact that it's not broken, that it's obsolete, and meaning it, for what it was meant to do 100 years ago, it was amazing, but for what it needs to do now, it's absolutely horrific. And when you understand the difference between broken and obsolete, you, you'll understand the changes that have to happen. So how do we make with an obsolete education system, mm -hmm. knowing that it's not gonna get fixed by the time somebody watches this video, mm -hmm. what can people do right now today uh -huh to overcome an obsolete education system, to become an innovator entrepreneur who actually knows how to execute. Sure. So if you think about it, you know, the first question you have to ask yourself is, what is an education and why do we want children to be educated? Because nobody ever asks that. Because once you know the answer to what problem you're trying to solve, the solution starts to become very, very different. And as you say, Tom, if you believe the education system is broken, the solution is somehow we can fix it. But if you believe the education system is obsolete, then you have a completely different solution, right? And for example, if you look at a cell phone, if you say the cell phone is primarily to make calls, 
then your grandpa is using your old phone, you know, the phone, the flip phone, and you say, grandpa, your phone is broken. And he said, no, it's not broken. It's designed to do what it's doing. Right. And today you look at the iPhone, it's designed to do different things. It is a data device first, it's a computer first, and the phone second, right? So it's really a different purpose, and that's why there is a different solution. So coming back to answer your question is, if we say the purpose of education is to create the productive citizens of the society, mm. then you start to say is imparting knowledge part of education. And you suddenly realize that in the world of the exponential technology, it doesn't matter what skill and knowledge you impart, it becomes obsolete faster than ever. That means in the next five to 10 years, whatever you learn is gonna become obsolete Unlike 100 years ago, whatever things you learned went on for 30, 40, 50 years. So you could actually have a productive career. <clears throat> so now in today's education system, the things you have to do is teach children how to solve problems. <clears throat> the most important thing we can do from an education perspective would be to create children who are intellectually curious. Because to me, the day you stop becoming intellectually curious, you have actually died. You become a zombie. If your mind is not growing and you stop learning, there is no purpose of living at that point. All right, that intellectual curiosity has clearly served you well. It's amazing, so I've known you now for a while. The, the, there seems to be no signs of letting up. You've obviously accomplished just a, a massive amount in your life. Walk us backwards. Sure. Like, is Naveen Jain today born of just an inherent intellectual curiosity and optimism, or was there a time when that had to take shape through force of will? Sure. So I grew up in a very, very humble beginning in India. There were uh, times we had no food to eat. My dad had a wonderful job, but that he decided to be an honest man, did not take bribes. And that means we had no food to eat. But worse yet, since he didn't take the bribe, his boss didn't get the bribe. And his boss's boss didn't get the bribe. Guess what happens in a government job like he was without taking bribe? You never get fired, you get transferred. Mm -hmm. Every six months we moved from village to village to village until we went to the most remote villages where there was no, nothing to be done. So he's not taking somebody's bribe away now. But we are now studying, sitting on a floor, there were no tables, no chairs, you sit on the floor, you write on the floor, and you learn. And despite all that, my sister went on to do a post-doctorate in applied mathematics. Wow. My brother had a PhD in statistics and computer science, and I was the least educated in my family with engineering from IIT and MBA. Came to United States with five dollars in my pocket, and, and didn't speak the language. But to me, it was a challenge and a great opportunity to be able to create a great life. So the way I think the best way to change society is simply two things. Allow people to dream so big that people think you're crazy. Every time you tell someone what you want to do and if they don't think you're crazy, you're not thinking big. So think so big that people think you're absolutely crazy and take away the people's fear of failure. Because the minute you take away people's fear of failure, they can do amazing things. To me, what I felt is as an entrepreneur, you never ever fail. You pivot. You only fail when you give up. Every idea that you do that does not work is simply a stepping stone to a bigger idea and a bigger success. So ideas may or may not work. You as human being never fail. The day you fail is the day you say, I give up. How have you been able to keep your enthusiasm? Um, I feel like if I woke you up in the middle of the night, you'd smile and be like, hey, I'm awake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, how have you sustained that? It's just love of life. Mm. Being happy or unhappy is your own choice. When you wake up in the morning, the God gives you a choice. Tom, do you want to be happy today? And if your answer is yes, he say, here are the 10 reasons. You have a wonderful family, you have great health, and you can list down the 10 reasons why you should be happy. And if you say, I want to be unhappy, God says, great choice, let me give you 10 reasons why you should be unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> so point is, happiness is a choice that you make. 
and you can make the choice that you want when you wake up in the morning, right? I actually don't sleep much. I get four or five hours of sleep. And really, I when, when I wake up in the morning, I am just, I jump out of the bed and I say, what a wonderful life. What can we do today? I was going to share some amazing news with you. Um, as you mentioned that one of the things um, I decided we're going to do is take a moonshot. And when people talk about moonshot, people talk about maybe building a good company. I'm talking about a literal moonshot <laughs> about going to the moon. And every time you tell people, and you know, you meet together, well, what are, what are you doing? Well, you know, I got a company. What kind of company? Well, you know, here and there. What? Well, no, no, what really are you doing? Well, I'm going to go to the moon and bring the resources back. You're, <laughs> fucking, you're fucking crazy. And I said, aha, I'm on to something. I'm thinking big enough. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I'm on to something here, right? The point is nobody has done that. But now people believe that a small group of people are capable of doing things that weren't only done by great superpowers like United States, Russia, and China. And now they assume an immigrant who didn't have a food to eat comes to this country and say, I'm going to land on the moon. I say, of course you're going to land on the moon. Tell me what are you going to bring back. <laughs> <laughs> so think about it. If I can land on the moon, what would you do? Right. What is your moonshot? And think about is when you land on the moon, it's not about landing on the moon. You showing people what is possible. Once you tell people the possibilities, what people do with that is amazing. The applications, they will think of it something that you and I can only imagine. And I think to me also landing on the moon is in some sense similar to a man running a mile under four minutes. People thought it could never be done and nobody ever did that until the first person showed it could be done. Guess what, 13 more people did that year after. So once you show people the small group of people can land on the moon. Mm. Next thing Tom will say, oh, that was easy. I'm going to go to Venus. Elon Musk says, I'm going to go to the Mars. But the fact is, there's not a single company that has actually have a right to leave Earth orbit. So what I was going to share with the news is that we will become the first company in the United States have granted the permission to leave the Earth orbit. So we talk about, most people don't understand. He said, but Elon goes to the space station all the time. They don't realize the space station is a low Earth orbit. Mm. It's not even the <laughs> Earth orbit where satellites are. There is not a company that has ever left Earth gravity, ever. Wow. Right? So think about it. Congratulations. It's amazing. But yeah, my, come on. But, That's incredible. But my point was, the only way the humans ever left Earth gravity, unless there were 24 astronauts who actually left Earth mm. gravity, was by simply by dying and you hope that your soul leave the, left the earth gravity. <laughs> wow. But imagine, we don't have a license to kill, but we have a license to take you off the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our thing. So, you know, coming back to my moonshot. So what would I bring back? Of course, you can say I can bring back platinum, I can bring back gold, I can bring back rare earth elements, I can bring back helium-3. And you know, I, know, I know how many people know about helium-3. It is probably the best resource to create a absolutely clean energy, a clean fusion energy, that a small quantity of helium-3 would power this planet for generations, right? Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> Naveen, how do you have that kind of self-belief? It's nuts. You have. No, no one on the outside would look at you and say, that's the guy that's going to take us to the moon. So what is it that allowed you to believe in yourself enough to do that? And how can other people learn to do well, it for oh, themselves? It's, it's a mindset. So as I said, it's a mindset of possibility. It's a mindset of abundance. And I think our friend Peter Diamandis mm -hmm. says it very, very well. The whole idea, we live in this mindset of scarcity in this thing where things people believe are in limited quantities and we fight over it. The minute we can change the mindset of people that you can be the dreamer, you can change to be what you want to be, everything is possible. The minute you think something is impossible, guess what happens? It becomes impossible for you, not for someone else. It becomes impossible just for you. So. Other thing that I don't know, Tom, we talked about, uh, I started my new venture, which is really my moonshots on Earth. And not talking about in terms of the company itself, but just telling you what is possible for us to do now. Mm. And I'm hoping that people who are listening to this 
will go out and do what I'm doing because there's nothing here that I'm doing is proprietary. So what I found is there is every single year, United States alone spends $500 billion in research and it's at national labs like Los Alamos, um, Lawrence Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore, Sandia, Pacific Northwest, all these national labs, NASA and university. There's tremendous amount of research. They spend tens of billions of dollars. So what I'm doing is looking at the big problems and saying what of these research and innovation can solve these problems. And the things that I'm finding, I, my jaws drop. Oh my God, what if people had that in their hand? It will change everything. To give you an idea, mm. a simple spray, you spray on a Kleenex. And when you sneeze, it tells you whether you have a flu or a cold whether you have a bacterial infection or viral infection. So when your kid is sick, you don't have to say, do I take half a day off, take my kid to the doctor? Mm. Is it really an ear infection or a strap or something? Or is simply a vir virus thing is gonna go away in two or three days? This thing exists today. They have the thing, a portable x-ray machine of the size of our iPhone. They spent $3 billion developing it for DOD. And it just sits there. And you know, all of those things are available to every single taxpayer in the United States. You can go there and take it and go build a company around it. So I tell everyone, this is your money. Go do something with it. So the reason I mention is I started a company simply to take these research. Mm. Can I solve the healthcare diagnostic? Can I go find a technology that can knock off the mosquitoes from carrying dengue fever, Zika, mm. malaria? Can we go out and increase the crop yield by simply increasing the photosynthesis? Can we go out and find a way to diagnose early cancer? And guess what? I am not a scientist, but these guys have been working in it for 30 years doing just that. They never find the entrepreneur who goes and takes this stuff and does it. So I'm saying all two and a half million of your followers should go land onto these things and take it and go change the world. It's in your hand to go make this world to be what you want it to be. So stop whining. Stop whining about Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or whosoever you don't like it. Just go out and change the world as an entrepreneur. Just let them get out of your way. Yeah. Naveen, like all of that stuff is so powerful. I want to take a minute and just recap. So, one, your ability to look at something that's so grand and say, I'm going to be the one to tackle that. As a kid who grew up very humble, um, coming to America with nothing in your pocket, cultivating self-belief. And I think the thing you've said that's most powerful and the, the thing that I'm hoping everybody watching takes away is every day you wake up and you have a choice. Every day you wake up and get to decide, do I want to be happy today? And the thing that you said that's so, like people miss it, is there are going to be answers yes. whether you say happy or sad. And they're going to be completely valid. Yes. But which one you focus on is going to determine the course of your life. And if you can, like, I'll give an example for yeah. myself. You're telling the story, you're saying that, hey, look, in today's education system, it no longer works. Um, and you're, the things that you know now are going to be useless five to ten years from now. Now, I think that there's two reactions to that. Both are real. Yeah. Both are valid. Yeah. So you simply have to choose which one you want to take. And for me, the answer is, oh, my gosh, I get to learn something new every five to ten years. This is amazing. And by the way, just because I failed in in algebra doesn't mean it's obsolete. I right. got a new thing now. <laughs> I can restart and get A again. <laughs> yeah, pivoting, right? To yeah. your point that like, it's only a failure if you end up stopping. And I, I've always had a big fear in life that one of the things that really messes with people yeah. is they hear this powerful information, but it comes in such a neat packaged way that you can put it on a poster, you can repeat it to your friend, yeah. and then it loses yeah. the intrinsic value. And when people look at someone like you, what I hope they see is somebody who wakes up every day and asks a very simple question, realizes that they have a choice, whether they want to be happy or they want to be sad, they choose mm -hmm. to be happy, they choose to believe in themselves, they cultivate a sense of belief, right? All through, like, very basic things. So talk to us all about 
blocking and tackling? Because you don't sure. believe that the greatest entrepreneurs are the no. ones with the greatest ideas, it's the ones with the greatest execution. That's right. So if you think about it, it doesn't matter how big the problem is. Your dream should be really big, but when it comes down to execution, you take a very small slice and say, let us find out what are the 10 things that need to be done to build this rainbow. And you said, let's take this piece and let's start focusing on executing just on that. And you finish that and you go to the next thing. So almost everything, it doesn't matter how big it is, you can take them into slices. They become so simple and it becomes simply blocking and tackling. So execution is a key to success. Other thing that I find in terms of what are the, e the easy thing that most people don't seem to find them as a common sense is, when you're looking for a friend, you want someone who is just like you. You want to hang out with a guy who just thinks like you, behaves like you, and talks like you. That's where the fun happens in a bar. But when you're looking for a co-founder, you want someone who compliments you. Somebody who is unlike you, who fills the gaps you have. And the third thing is, it's just all about teamwork, right? That means you put this your team together, and you enjoy every minute of the journey. The life as an entrepreneur is extremely lonely. So when you are a, as a CEO, it's a very lonely job because every decision you make is gonna impact some people. As you succeed to enjoy every milestone, if you don't enjoy the milestone and not enjoying the journey, what happens you reach the destination and you look back and you say, for what? I didn't enjoy it. But if you're enjoying the journey, it doesn't matter how many miles you travel, you have loved every minute of it. Making money is a byproduct. Don't focus on making money. Money comes when you go out and do great things. So it is a byproduct. It is not the destiny or a goal in itself. It happens. Yeah, that's, that's really, really true. And I worry though that people miss out on that. And I think, uh, I know that's something that I've struggled with. I've talked very publicly about how early business for me was a total yep. misery. I was focused yep. only on the end goal. Yep. It's all about getting rich. Yep. Um, and then once you switch your mindset, yep. right? Everything yep. comes back to mindset. You've yep. been super, super clear about that. Um, once you switch your mindset and you start asking different questions and you refocus your attention on what am I trying to accomplish, how can I enjoy things along the way, yeah. and maybe most importantly, what is that thing that if I have to pivot a thousand yeah. times, yeah. if it doesn't go right the first time, if the ideas in the early days are bad, what do I care about enough yeah. to keep pushing forward in order to get to the point where we don't quit? Because to, to go back to your blocking yeah. and tackling, yeah. which I think is so important, man, and I really, really want people to hear is that execution is the only thing that matters. So I wear the shirt all the time, it says do. Yeah. Um, and the reason I wear that is to remind myself that only the blocking and tackling yep. matters. Only the action, the activity, the actual progress. If you're not moving forward, if you don't know what your goal is and you're not taking real yep. concrete steps to get there, like that's a problem because it's a problem because you won't get where you want, where you want to go. Also, some people confuse the movement with moving forward. They go in... Talk, talk more about that, please. <laughs> Tell people what you mean by that. No, so what happens is they're busy doing things and they think they're busy. They go around the circle, but they're always moving. To move yes. forward, you have to know what, where you're going. So you can't run in a circle and say, I'm just tired, I'm doing a lot of things, I'm so busy. It's to know where the destination is and have a clear navigation how you're gonna get there. And the second thing, Tom, is all about is that people always feel that they have a trap to themselves. They set the limit of what they can achieve. And I remember even if you ask someone who is most optimistic, will say, I can do anything I want. The sky is the limit. <laughs> now imagine that. And people don't understand there is no such thing as sky. The sky is a figment of our imagination. So what you're really saying is, I limit myself to what I imagine, and I imagine my limit to be this figment, right. which doesn't exist, which is the sky, right? And you know, also this whole idea of people talk about, well, there are people who think about, is the glass half full or the glass half empty? And you know, I think nobody ever ask, why does it matter whether the glass is half full or half empty? What matters is, do you care enough to fill that glass?
is this a glass worth filling? So you have to ask your skull question. It doesn't matter whether it's half full or half empty. Does Tom care to fill this glass? And if the answer is yes, then irrespective of it's half full or half empty, I'm going to fill the damn glass irrespective. Mm. Right? So knowing what is important to you is what matters, not what it is. Yeah, God, that's so true. And what a great quote. Is this glass worthy of being filled? I really like that. And I think a lot of people don't ask that. And I want to tie that back to something that you said earlier about your co-founders, yeah. um, which is a big deal. Something I think a lot about having founders who very much, um, we are very different. Yeah. And we're, we've often said that Quest is a unique fingerprint of the three of us. It's, yeah. it's the ways that we're similar and most importantly, the ways that we're different. And when people are able to honestly assess themselves, their desires and their skill set. Mm -hmm. And it can be hard to say, I don't have a skill set that I actually value, right? So let's take Mike Osborne, yeah. my business partner. He yeah. has a skill set that I really, really value. Yeah. But the truth is I don't have it. That's perfect and, partner. Right? Yes. Yeah. But I think people have a hard time accepting that they're not good at it. Yeah. And then, so you try to pretend to be good at it and then you leave no room for the person who or actually worse is good yet. at it. You don't value just because you don't have it. You think yeah. it's not worth yes. having it. So Awesome. Naveen, give us your definition of a life well lived. So I think, you know, most of people who have, uh, you know, we live a life of success. To me, a life lived well is a life of significance where you are able to go out and actually able to help billions of people around the world. We feel happy. I mean, we talked about happiness, right? So there's some things people get confused is that uh, in our brain, the dopamine. So every time we achieve a goal and every time we set a goal and achieve a goal, we get this shot of dopamine and we feel really good. But problem with that is like a caffeine shot. Two hours later, we want the next one. And you constantly are always struggling because you one goal to another goal and you keep achieving and you go home and say, I'm getting all these bonuses, I'm getting all these promotions, but I'm just not happy. So what is that drives happy? Happiness actually comes from serotonin. <clears throat> and it comes from the fact when you give something without any expectations of getting anything back. If you give something with an expectations of something, you don't get that. And that comes, you know, that's true love is mother. I've never seen a, anything, a pure bond that's a mother and a child. That bond is so strong that mother is willing to give everything she has to this child. And there's one story that my mother told me when I was very young and it always tears me up. It talks about the actual motherly love. And here's the thing. She told me there was a kid who wanted to join the gang and went to the gang and said, I am ready. And they say, well, we know you're ready if you can go out when your mother is sleeping, cut her chest, get her beating heart, and if you can bring her that beating heart back, we know you're ready to join this gang. The kid goes there, cuts her mom, takes a beating heart, and he's walking out, and he trips over. And the heart says, son, are you okay? Right? That motherly love, she didn't care what he did, she just cared about, is he okay? And to me, that type of love, we can give it to every human being. We don't have to be mother and child. When you actually can sit down to a person who is homeless and not just simply drop a dollar and feed yourself, oh, I am just such a generous guy, I feel so good. Sit down and give him five minutes of your time. And if you give him five minutes of your time, you've done more for him than any money you will give him because he just wants to be heard. And more importantly, you gave something that you can never get back. You can make more money. You can get more of everything. The time you give, you can never take back. And don't fall for the thing, oh, I give charity, I give money. That is not philanthropy. And as Tom said, giving money, philanthropy is not about giving money. Philanthropy is about solving a problem. So if you want to do philanthropy, become a great entrepreneur and solve the problem. But when you care someone, give them your time. And Naveen, Thanks. thank you so much thank for coming you. on the show. It was fucking beautiful, man. That was seriously beautiful. That was officially one of the most beautiful closing words I think a guest has ever given us. That was incredible. I, I have the good fortune of knowing that he is this guy when there's no one else around. 
Inside Naveen is an internal compass, a worldview, a belief system that he honors every day with the way he acts. The things that he said I've seen at work in him, the choice to be happy and the way that focusing on that, knowing that it's a choice and knowing that any day he could have woken up and chosen to be unhappy and to focus on the things that are going wrong or that aren't where he wants them to be, but he doesn't. And so every event, every dinner, every uh, debate, board meeting, it doesn't matter. He shows up as a bundle of energy, enthusiasm, passion, optimism, and he infects those around him with that. And I take that as a challenge myself to focus on the things that are going to put me in that state, that are going to give me the serotonin that you're talking about, that are going to give me the passion and drive and just the love of life that anybody needs to go out and really tackle the big challenges and to understand that empty dreaming is not enough. At some point, you have to focus entirely on execution, taking it bit by bit. Go two miles, make a left, go a mile, make a right. Break your world down into those pieces. You will enjoy the odyssey that is learning about this man. So do yourself a favor. Just go to Google and drop his name in Naveen Jain. You won't be sorry. Naveen, where can they find you online? Hi, I'm on the Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook. And I'm easily um, available. I read all my emails, naveen.jain at gmail.com. And I'll read every single email. Wow. Well, you all now have an uh, uncle who's a billionaire that's going to read your email. So, oh. my friends, take advantage. Uh, yes, he is an incredible man. You will enjoy it. Guys, you can also find more out about him on InsideQuest.com. We're going to have not only this video, but other features. Uh, we have made radical changes to our website, a lot more enriching material, all the behind the scenes, extra information, anything that you might want on that person. Our goal truly is to give back and to do exactly what this man is encouraging us to do, which is if you want to be somebody who's truly philanthropic, be an entrepreneur who knows how to educate and give something back. This community has already given so much to the people uh, in the community that you will forever have our gratitude. You guys are incredible. Until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thanks so much. Guys.